All right. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for this part two of our mandibular temporal lateral rotary movement influences on the ankle and foot this time. Um, just wanted to let everyone know before we get started here that the handouts have been posted to the webinars page on our website. Um, hopefully everyone that was registered also received another email from Zoom with the direct link to those handouts as well. But if you don't get them right now, you can always get them later. They will remain up there. But if you want the handouts for the webinar, you can go ahead and print those now. Otherwise, if you have any questions during the webinar, um, please remember that you can send those as chat, but I'm not going to be answering questions throughout the webinar. Um, we will answer questions at the end of the webinar. Um, we'll, you know, take 15, 20, 25 minutes, um, whatever we need to answer several questions at the end. Um, so just a little bit different than a course for this webinar, I will answer questions at the end. Um, otherwise, uh, I hope you enjoy um, part two of this webinar, and I will turn it over to Ron. All right. Thanks, Jen. Thank you. Thank you for, for coming, everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, I wrote this webinar up in my, having uh, this on my mind. Uh, there's a lot of material that uh, is basic material. So for those in the room that have been around PRI for a while, uh, we're gonna we're gonna we we're gonna cover some things that I've never really covered in this kind of a manner. Uh, in other words, basic what what really is important with this bone when you look at uh, the topic today, and that is lateral rotary movement. Uh, so keep that in mind. And there are probably going to be people who watch this webinar in the future, Jen, that are going to get a little confused by some terminology that we use in this institute. And if you do, you know, look for those PRI-minded people around you, these healthcare professionals that have taken a few courses in PRI or may have may have certification behind their name, so you get the help and the assistance you need uh, when it comes to the material in this particular webinar. So I want to get that out right away. I don't think it'll hurt any of us to uh, stay a little basic. And I know there's concepts I'm introducing for the first time that are going to be confusing. And that's not new. But what might be different is that the confusion should enlighten you in terms of where all of us are at in life when it comes to forward movement and the, the reasoning behind you know, us having this thing called a mandible for that kind of activity. So we're going to get right into it. And uh, Jen's already giving you the title of the of this webinar. So we're going to start off with a, with a word called regulation. And that is, uh, that is this bone called the mandible. It's, a, it's one of the most unique bones we have in our body. Uh, it regulates rhythm of the temporal bone, which is on each side of that mandible. Uh, the mandible will do anything you, you can imagine when it comes to direction. I mean, it, you're going to see a slide coming up where the thing slides up and down at the same time it's going forward and back and opening and closing uh, and, and moving around. It's also compressing and decompressing and it's, it allows us to shift. It's what we really, it's our closest activity we have to our central nervous system and for that matter, autonomic nervous system function. It feeds fuels and uh, uh, frees us up. And then it can also do the, do the counterpart, will totally lock us up. So I used to work in uh, situations where uh, a lot of oral surgeons referred me patients with TMD, temporal mandibular dysfunction. I learned very quickly that the temporal mandibular joint is not, is not the issue. The issue is what forces are placed on that joint and you have two of them. And those counter forces can have more of an impact on our body and our system's regulation than the actual site of pain. So we're going to keep that in mind too. So regulation is the theme. Regulation is what this bone's all about. Uh, the mandible is the only facial bone that we have that is not dependent upon the position or movement of the sphenoid. And this bone, uh, the mandible, needs freedom to move in order for us to enjoy life. Uh, that's called temporal. Uh, life is temporal. And our temporal bones need to move and wobble during cranial breathing and expansion and cranial movement for compression. We compress, we compress first and foremost in this thing called the cranium. That's how we get signals sent around, these electrical impulses sent around our body saying, move or don't move or stand still and 
or hold your breath. It all starts with this regula regulatory system through a bone called the mandible. It's the only facial bone that we have that communicates with the sphenoid uh, the way it does. There's nothing that communicates better with that sphenoid than the, uh, than the mandible. And I mean that directly and indirectly as we're gonna see in this webinar. So its tactility comes not only from the teeth that uh, sit in it, but also from the direction uh, that it puts soft tissue through. So the stresses, we're gonna talk a little bit about reflexes, all this soft tissue movement that we're experiencing around our face, uh, in our face and through our neck comes from this movement. And that movement is, is, I like this slide because it has the word competing. In other words, where you move, something had to give. And in order for you to move, there's always something that's either uh, lengthening, at the same time something is shortening, but there's this ongoing, uh, ongoing communication going between the two sides of this mandible that's competing for tactile cueing, uh, whether it's proprioceptive cueing of the joint uh, or haptic uh, cueing from the, the, uh, the tissue around that mandible, or better yet, occlusal awareness from the alveolar nervous system, the alveolar nerves themselves. There's a lot of uh, tactile uh, communication going on that's competitive in nature. And the bone has, um, and you can, you can uh, study this thing. I love this bone. It's, a, it's just one of my favorite bones of the body because it's got an angle. There's an angle to it. It's got a neck. We're gonna talk about necks in the next hour. And it's, it's a rotary type of function. In other words, that condylar head, the very top of that neck, um, allows for rotary pivoted, pivotal movement uh, for the entire body, not just for the temporal bones that lay on top of it. Um, so when one, one ramus, when one side of that, that bone is moving or rotating, the other side has to be doing something along with it. Uh, so I think we forget that. We do not, we do not have to move our femur on the right side uh, when the left one's moving. We do not have to do it. We do not have to move our humeral bone, our arm bone on one side because the other one is moving. We do not have to do it. But we have to move one side if the other side is moving. We have to move. And it's it's important for you to know that the movement on the other side of the side that you think you're movement, moving is no less or more important than the side you think is moving because the side you think is moving may not be the real, may not be the side that you're getting most afferentation for efferent, efferentation from. You sense it, but there may be more going on on the other side. And as we go through this webinar, please keep that in mind. What really keeps you aware of your two condyles, as you're gonna see in this discussion, is what you're doing with the things on the floor and what you do with things that you sit on called ischial seats. Uh, so we'll be getting into that, the, the communication of what this bone depends on requires the entire system to feel this word alternate, shift. And it does that through these two condylar heads. And again, this, when we talk about this, this, in this information, this webinar, remember that it, it's not a lot of movement. It's not like you need a, a, a measuring system like a goniometer to record this movement. It's very, very, very finite movement. It's small oscillatory movement. Uh, it's movement every time you take a breath, there's movement through those two condyles. Anytime you, you, you sit down, there's movement on those, on those joints. This joint's an active joint. The minute you start moving around the entire body, anywhere in the body, you know it at these two joints. They're polar, they're polar joints. They have poles that are constantly in rotation. So this is a... a illustration that shows you that there's lots of these arrows going around and in other courses in this institute we dissect this out a little bit and we start talking about well if this temporal bone on the right side is going in the temporal bone usually on the left side will be going out or if the temporal bone on the right side is turning one direction the other one should be going in the opposite direction that's called anterior versus posterior rotation now it's not really important today 
to go over how one set of arrows compares with the other set of arrows. What's important to know is that you have two mandibles. You have a mandible on the right side that's responsible for temporal, fu temporal function, and that temporal function on the right side controls what's going on between the two temporal bones, the midbrain of your body, the midsection of your body called the sphenoid. All of our sphenoidal activity starts with where this menti or the front of this mandible is actually directing it. When you, when you talk about sphenoids, and not that we talk about them a lot, when you talk about um, uh, sphenoids are related to how we use our nasal pharynx, the back of our throat. When you talk about hearing and how you use your temporal bones, you can't avoid what's going on with that discussion by not talking about where is the mandible, because the mandible is what keeps us together. It keeps one side aware of the other side via these two ramuses and these two condylar, condylar heads. So I love, I love this only to remind us that we shudder, we oscillate, we wobble, uh, we rotate, we, we micro move, mic, the micro movement of our temporal joints all depends on this mandible's ability to either uh, uh, reg regulate that activity or be responsible for that activity. The occiput, which is the bone that is in the back of your head, along with the paired temporal bones and the two condylar necks of the mandible, are, are communicating with this, uh, this world we have through these muscles called lateral pterygoids. And the lateral pterygoids are attached to the sphenoid bone, the middle bone of your head, and attaches to the, the mandible. The sphenoid bone has the greatest impact on the midbrain, midbrain, as I just said a few minutes ago. And all of our sense of ourself begins with that sphenoid and the regulation of it from the mandible. So it's really hard for me to talk about a sphenoid bone and then not in the back of my mind think the regulator of the sphenoid bone, which is, which is obviously your mandible. I think the purpose of these webinars right now, if you wanna know the truth, Jan, is the purpose is to get people more aware of how important is it, it is to look at postural activity as it relates to a, a bone that many of us put you know, next to the word dentistry or occlusion or optometry. But this mandible is more of a postural bone than it is a bone for vision, hearing, or interpretation of teeth. So just keep that in mind. That's the purpose of these webinars is to share with you what I know and think is going on when it comes to regulation in general with all of our senses. It's a very, very forgotten, often forgotten about bone. So when you see these two bones, the sphenoid bone and the temporal bone, they, can, they are in constant communication with each other via what you're doing with your mandible. And the next time you see a mandible in front of you, and if you see anybody in front of you that talks, they're using their mandible. They happen to have teeth on the mandible and they have teeth on the maxillas, the upper, upper part of the mouth. But the communication is not necessarily through the occlusion. In fact, when I get done talking and I rest, I should have this mouth that's relaxed. There should be an open airway about a millimeter or two between my set of teeth. I don't depend on my teeth, nor should I ever depend upon where I'm at with my tongue. What regulates our activity from side to side is this thing called freedom. Freedom of speech, freedom of sight, freedom of sound. And to do that, you have to have this mandible stay in a position where it's free to move. And the minute the mandible is locked up for whatever reason it might be, your movement is gonna be steered and directed by that static state of sense of the mandible. The quickest interpretation of who you are comes from these two sets of bones, these two bones, the, the sphenoid and the temporal bone via the regulation by the mandible. So our sense of ourself, the sense of where we're at, the sense of what we're doing, the midbrain itself, how we regulate that activity that's going through that foramen is really the responsibility of this mandible. We have a hyoid that knows where it's at, that's the front of your neck. We have a base of your skull that knows where it's at, that's the back of the neck. And that constant communication between where the front of the mandible to the two back sides of the mandible is constantly feeding information on where are you moving and why. The sphenoid bone 
being internally wedged and articulating with 12 other bones, four single bones, the vomer, the ethmoid, the frontal, and the occiput, and four paired bones, paired bones, the parietal bones, the temporal bones, your zygomatic bones, and your palatine bones, all exhibit the least amount of frontal plane movement we have in our body. In other words, these, these bones, these 12 other bones, really are there to move and expand and compress, but they're not really the best system for side-to-side -side movement. The best system for side-to-side -side movement is the mandible. The mandible connects with, communicates with all these other bones. But these other bones were given to you for one purpose, uh, to expand and compress, to expand and compress. And they all limit the degree of, the degree of lateral rotary movement. Otherwise, we'd fall apart like a bag of bones. So our sacrum and our sternum and our floors that we stand on are all held together for us by these 12 pair of bones, 12, 12 sets of bones. And those bones are regulated by where you, how you move from side to side with the number one bone that moves you from side to side called the mandible. This came from Rothbard. And I like this slide and Jen, I'll, I'm gonna to point to this and you'll follow with me. There's the, there's the temporal bone and the temporal bone has this bone that's uh, uh, in front of it called the sphenoid bone. And that sphenoid and temporal bone are communicating with each other uh, via this, this mandible. And there's muscles that attach directly from this mandible to the sphenoid. And there's muscles directly attached to this mandible that go to or from the temporal bones. So the temporalis muscle, the pterygoid muscles, and other muscles and soft tissue, this is a, a harmonious regulato regulatory functional set of bones that give you sense of posture. That's where our posture really begins. So when I move my mandible one direction, my body will, will either go there or not. Uh, we don't do that because we move our ankles over to the right and left, and we don't do it because we move our arms over there. We do it through this intrinsic design of condylar movement within these two fossa, these two fossas of the temporal bone. Humans have two jaws, a left one and a right one, and each has a temporal bone and the maxilla bone that the mandible on the right and the mandible on the left reference through this occlusal guidance. And when I use the word occlusal guidance, remember occlusal guidance is not just a, a word for teeth. Your occlusal guidance begins, uh, begins in the mandibular temporal joint. That's occlusal guidance. So when your mandible moves, it's guided by a temporal bone. That's occlusion. We need occlusion. We need sense of compression. And then you have these bones here that allow that guidance to stop and start when you don't move the mandible. And they're called maxillas, and you've got two of them. And these two bones will move a little bit. They don't move a lot, but they shift on us. It's called the mid face. So please take, a, you know, take note of that. Your mid face begins here. This is where your mid face begins. This is where the airway begins. This is where all of our airway function begins. It doesn't begin in the mouth. It begins in this, this surface below the orbits of the eye, which I'm going to talk about in the next webinar. It begins in this region where you have a nasal pharynx. And that nasal pharynx, pharynx is totally reflective of how well those two poles on that mandible will steer the temporal bones one way and will, or will steer, steer the temporal bones another way. Humans become very patterned in temporal orientation because of poor mandibular steering. The bones that regulate the orientation of the mandible and the temporal bones excuse me, what, are, are the temporal bones. So here's a good picture of that, Jen. We have a, a set here, and we have a set here from two different angles. And I like the way that, you know, we, we, I took this photograph primarily to remind you, we don't have to get caught up in anatomy today. We don't have to get ca caught up in, is this a pattern of the face or a position these bones are in? And is it reflective of how humans breathe and work and stand? Here's what we really should reflect on. This is a complete system. This is a system. If I take the temporal bones off, you no longer have a mandible. If I take the mandible off, you do not have a cranium. 
You can't work one without the other. It's a system. So when you say the word mandible, you're talking cranium. And when you say the word temple, you're talking air regulation because it's a system. One cannot work with the other. That's really important for all of us to remember that. And we get into these orthopedic discussions like it's a, like it's a, 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 a joint called a hip or a joint. No, it's not even close to a joint called a hip. It's not a shoulder joint. There's a lots of similarities. This one is doing very little structural support. It's, regula it's regulatory. So I threw this out to remind all of, this, all of us, that is a system that requires both temporal bones and both mandible bones. I'm looking at four bones. I'm not looking at three. I'm looking at four bones. And the more you get away from this point of this bone right here, the more movement you're going to have over here in the top. This cannot move without these moving. And yet you're working with patients that can't move over their ankles. They can't shift their body away from side to side. And so right away, you got to be mindful of the fact that if they're not shifting from side to side correctly on their ankles, they're definitely not shifting from side to side correctly with those two temporal bones. So well, as we go through this webinar, please keep in mind this, this illustration. Mandibular protrusion or forward movement of the mandible can result from internal internal rotation or internally rotated temporal bones through the anterior lateral fossa movement or can result from overuse of one or both of the lateral pterygoids. And that's really what we're gonna talk a lot about. Lateral pterygoids need to move the mandible forward. So the temporal bones can allow the cranium to move back. Without the cranium's ability to move back, you don't have one set of bones working with another. They're locked up. And when the mandibles is locked up in the temporal bones, that cranium's ability to expand and rotate and twist does not occur very well. This can result in forward advancement of the mandible and often facial and foot over compression syndromes. Every time I see a foot in a pronated state, I'm pretty certain that there's a complementary activity going on between the temporal bone and the mandible. The mandible, is, the mandible is, is meant to move forward, but if you can't move the mandible forward and the head goes forward, you're going to pronate. You're going to pronate in a lot of areas. But the first word that most of us as healthcare specialists re recognize is the word foot. You're going to see foot pronation. You'll see arm pronation. We're going to focus on two muscles of the foot today. So this is an important slide to remind you that it's not the head's position you should worry about. It's the mandibular ability to control the head. What moves the mandible forward? There's two things. Uh, a, a head that moves one direction, as you're gonna see in, in a slide coming up, or pterygoids that move the mandible forward, it, it forward instead of the head going forward. And this is the slide. If I move that head, Jen, if I move that head in a posterior direction, I don't need lateral pterygoids. My mandible will now go forward for me. But unfortunately, if my mandible is going forward because I posteriorly rotated my head, my head is now going forward. And if my head goes forward, I'm not going to use my pterygoids to move my mandible forward. I'm going to lock up my pterygoids to stabilize the midsection of my head. And now my midface won't develop. And I'm going to have problems with my palate and palatine bones and breathing. It goes on and on and on. So really all I'm trying to do with these webinars is to make sure we all focus on the real issue of mid-face development. Mid-face development begins with two, two bones, the mandible and, the, and these temporal bones. And those temporal mandibular movements and those mandibular temporal movements are, are, are absolutely necessary for all posture of, the, of, the, of that upright human being. And you've got two sides of them. And the thing that keeps us moving over our feet from side to side when we walk are these things that move us from side to side. I drew on the board before we started the webinar today. Jen, I'm gonna pull that out now. And just a quick reminder, and I want, the, I want this to be a kindergarten class. I don't wanna get into all this discussion about PRI's patterns today, but I do wanna remind all of you that you have a, a sphenoid bone 
that has a mandible attached to it through lateral pterygoids. And you got two lateral pterygoids. You also have a spine that has this humeral bone attached to it. And you have latissimus dorsum muscles going to it from the spine. You have two, two latissimus dorsums. You have a pubis bone that has two sets of adductor magnus muscles going down to the femur bones. And all three of these bones, all three sets, have a word called neck. Each one of them has a neck. And those necks were given to you for those adductors to move you in a lateral rotary direction. Now, therefore, the title of the webinar, lateral rotary direction. And that lateral, lateral rotary direction begins with an activity provided by this adductor magnus, this latissimus dorsum, not these. These are slaves to that because there's no way you're going to use these muscles correctly if those lateral pterygoids aren't permitting your head and neck to go one direction or the other as it should when you move from side to side. I've always said, you know, if you've got an ankle injury that's going on and on and on in life with somebody, the sprain, the recurrence is not because of the ankle. It's because of the mid face. And that mid face has got an attitude. And so when that attitude can be, be brought down a little bit by freedom to move from side to side with muscles that regulate the big bone of the body, the sphenoid, which is where that big bone of the big muscle of the body comes off of. The adductor magnus is a big muscle up here. It controls this little adductor magnus. It controls your latissimus dorsum. The two muscles that often we see lock us up. When those muscles are locked up, it's pretty clear to me that you've got some problems with the other set of neck muscles that you haven't really thought about. And that would be the condylar necks of a mandible. So I'm only putting that up there so we can move forward in this course, this webinar a little faster. I just wanna help you all appreciate the fact that this is not a segmental issue. This is a universal issue. There's no such thing as a segmental individual out there. So this is why I'm putting a little emphasis on that word, pterygoid. And so you've seen this in other courses and I've asked Jen to help me with this by putting some arrows on this particular skeleton model of, an, of a, a person moving to the right. When that mandible moves to the right, this body's gonna go to the right. And we've got a lot of that information in this webinar if you look forward, forward and for it. So without getting into the discussion about what's going, Jen, on with the femoral neck or the humeral neck or the, even the mandibular neck today, that's not relevant today. What's relevant today is all three sets of those necks. And you got a setup here. There's a left one and a right one are regulated by this tension. And if this tension is not tensegrity minded, that means it can give. Your entire system is going to brace. And that's because of the autonomic dysfunction that's going on in the sphenoid region where these two little muscles attach. This bone called the pubis is a autonomic site. This spine is called an autonomic site. And that sphenoid is an autonomic site. And that resolution, that resolution of tension is regulated by rhythmic flow that's produced primarily by the, 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 system or, the system that's orally controlling what you sound like. So when you look at this thing called growth, excessive growth of the entire cranium produces a narrow facial area. An excessive internal rotation of the temporal bone is the most common lesion seen with that excessive internal rotation of the temporal bone. So when those, inter when those temporal bones internally rotate, you're not getting enough mandibular movement. You can put anything you want in the mouth, any ALF, any product, any appliance, anything you wanna do for expansion. But that child, that human that's growing needs to learn how to move the mandible it's the best ALF that child has. And I'm gonna slow down and remind all of you of that. We were given that mandible for those pterygoids to help your face grow and expand and temporal bones to externally rotate. 
So cranial systems can go in this beautiful world of flexion, not extension. Underutilization of the pterygoid function more than likely contributes to this excessive temporal internal rotation. And the temporalis muscle is the first muscle that's gonna pull you into internal rotation. So if you're bracing all day long by pulling your mandible up and back, and you can't get your mandible go to go forward and down, or it's forward and to one side, uh, you're not a normal machine. <laughs> so this whole process of movement requires us to respect the importance of necks. Necks keep people away from you. You don't have to see a specialist if you use them. You know, the volatility of what you do is all regulated by this thing called the neck. The necks of the skeletal structure are primarily responsible for alternation. And again, I would tell you to underline that word. We can't alternate without necks. They give us the ability to move and rotate. Not just move from side to side. A neck will allow you to move and rotate. That's why the title is called lateral rotary, because you have necks. Uh, they're, they're, they're important for our body to counteract forces with. They produce a wedge, a keystone kind of effect on our bodies, especially down the lower part of our body. They allow us to produce uh, enough resistance to gravity so we do not fall when we swing our legs or swing our arms or swing ourselves side to side, forward and back and up and down. So just, just uh, take note of that, circle it, neck. That neck is given to you for the mandible and the mandible is given to you for that neck. And you got one there and you got one here, you know, an anatomical neck. And then finally, you definitely should remember that you got this beautiful neck called the condylar neck. And if you're wearing out heads of femurs, I can promise you, I can promise you one thing, you're not working your, your condylar necks because you're, you're either in a malocluded, malware position. So uh, <laughs> what regulates our hips? Uh, what regulates our floor? Our necks. They allow us to adapt ourselves to the ground we stand on and live through and rotary mechanical movement. Uh, we have limitations that have been evolved over many, many years based on what we did with our lower extremities and what we put ourselves through with our lower extremities. Our facial region was developed through what we did with our feet. We didn't wear shoes. We didn't have concrete. We explored with these piggy toes and these arches and these heels because we were allowed to. We were chewing food that was hard, that broke once in a while. We had many kinds of material going in our mouth. It wasn't processed. It's not the gut necessarily. It's what we were actually doing with mechanical vibration through the entire system called mastication, swallowing, and speech. The next of these three pair bones, when working correctly with their counterparts, reduces the compensatory and the adaptative stresses placed on the entire body, but especially the neck, the cervical spine, or our neck, and its associated muscles for balance of our erect body. Our neck gets blamed for so many things, but our neck would work fine if all the other three sets of necks were alternating with each other. Any functional alteration of the oral cavity, which involves an alteration of the biomechanical, biomechanics of the mandible articulation with the temporal bone produces an alteration of the functions of masticatory muscles which can be transmitted to all the distal muscles through muscle chains that direct movement around vertical axes. So it's a lot to say, but it basically looks like this. We have a foot down there that is running off of a vertical axis, a vertical axis, because we're erect mammals. Our posture requires us to rotate around a side with vertical axis mindfulness. That begins here. There's a side with vertical axis mindfulness. The pterygoid, when it moves the mandible to one direction, 
when that mandible is going to your, your right because of a pterygoid on the left or a genioglossus on the left, which we're going to talk about, we are free now to rotate around that foot that the weight is going toward. But if your mandible doesn't allow the head to rotate on the mandible, you're going to brace your neck by pulling yourself over to one side. And the first thing that's going to know that is the podal system. And that foot will then brace. And the next thing you know, you sprain. You sprain the foot, you tear a muscle, you break a bone. All because the orientation possibly wasn't allowed because of vertical axial rotation, lateral rotation by the, the mandible. And I've got a lot of research in the back of this webinar that I, if we have time, we'll go through that'll support everything I'm saying. The muscle relationship of the mandible and feet goes on by, by, by a few, few minutes of discussion when it comes to primary function. The primary function of the lateral pterygoid muscle is to provide protrude the mandible at anteriorly and deviate it or move the mandible to the opposite side. It also aids in opening the anterior and lateral walls of the nasal pharynx, as I mentioned earlier, and that's a big deal, especially in this world of airway management that all of us are so concerned about. There's no bone in your body that's going to contribute to a good airway patency more than the mandible. Please remember I said that. As it will create a passage to the nasal pharyngeal airway or not. When the left and right genioglossus, that would be your tongue muscles, act together with the, man, the pterygoids, they will expand your oral pharynx. They'll expand your oral pharyngeal region, the back of your throat. And so when you look at these muscles, these, these lateral pterygoids, this expands the midface. It expands the oral pharyngeal, oral pharyngeal cavity. It expands the diameter within the two two sides of the, the wings of the sphenoid. It gives you the ability to wobble and experience things that you didn't before called resonation. Frequencies inside the electrical system you have up there called the brain is, 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 is free to, to challenge itself with new novel awarenesses that you didn't even know you had. So that muscle is not a muscle that's moving uh, a mandible for occlusal forces. On the contrary, this muscle has no desire to occlude anything between the teeth. It has everything, it has all the desire to disocclude you. The primary function of the genioglossus muscle is to protrude the tongue anteriorly and deviate the tongue to the opposite side. It also aids in swallowing as it will create a passage. You know, we got an E there, Jen. Create a passage to the gastrointestinal tract. When the left and right genioglossal muscles act together, they will also depress the middle part of the tongue, thus opening your airway. So I like this slide because it's a, it's a, it's a dissection of a genioglossal muscle and the right, this is the right genioglossal muscle. And when it gets really work, it works to move the jaw to the left, along with the counterpart called the right lateral pterygoid. So the right genioglossus and the right lateral pterygoid directs the mandible to the left. And that's what Hannah's doing here. And the left genioglossus, along with the left lateral pterygoid, directs the mandible to the right. Now, we've been doing this for years, Jan, and I still don't believe most, but most of us understand the significance of doing that in an upright position with your weight on your podal surfaces, your plantar grade surfaces of, of the floor, of the, of the foot that you stand on the floor with. A huge issue. Moving your mandible from side to side, laying on your back, isn't going to do a thing for the mid-face. It will do nothing for your, pharynx, for your pharynx. You were meant to stand and do this, to sit and do this, and yes, to kneel and do this. Some cultures, that's all they do is squat and kneel to do this. This is an upright issue. This is a postural issue. 
Uh, this is a balance issue. This is a vestibular issue. This is an anti-gravitational floor issue, ground issue. This is for locomotor movement issues. As you're gonna see in all the webinars I do with this lateral rotary function, the mandible is what really gives you the human ability to be a mammal. Uh, we sucked with it, we talk with it while you move. You regulate all your function when it comes to the pelvis and the diaphragms that you, the diaphragms of the pelvis and thorax with it because it gradiates and, and gradually uh, resists you with pressure. So it's a, a big deal when it comes to movement from side to side, obviously. And the left lateral pterygoid along with the right posterior tibialis tendon moves the mandible to the right the center of gravity hips to the right, and we call that right AFIR if you're in, in, the, in a PRI mode, and the right foot into inversion when in an upright state of kneeling and standing. The left genioglossus and the left lateral pterygoid along with the right posterior tibialis tendon and the left perineals contribute to left eversion, left foot eversion. And again, you hand this webinar, you got a wonderful set of handouts. I, I saw Jen send them to you, and you can go back and look at this. But what I'm doing here is I'm tying muscles of the foot with muscles of the mouth. And it's imperative that you appreciate that they're not separable. It's imperative. And if I take the mandible off, you are not going to use your feet correctly. And if I take your feet off, you will not use your mandible correctly. It's imperative that you understand that. The research will tell you that. So by working with humans on their feet, on their ischial seats or on their knees, you're gonna work a mandible. But if you take them and put them in other positions, you're not isolating the, the mandible. So this is a, a reflection of right foot eversion for those people in the room that are not healthcare specialists, that's a right foot eversion. And Jan's gonna show you the right foot inversion. Uh, this right foot eversion, um, this right foot eversion is where you would see somebody with a pronated foot or a flat foot. This is an over, over lateralized foot. And we're gonna tie these feet to the mandible. So when, you, when I see a patient and you go, Ron, how did you know what was going on with their feet? I would say, well, look at their mandible. It tells you what they're doing with their feet. Look where their mandible's going. Look which genioglossus is stronger, which one's weaker. Now Jan's going to tell you a little bit about what we talked briefly about, Jan, while I get a drink of water. So we don't mess people up here uh, about these things called temporal bones and why we move mandibles one direction versus the other in certain techniques in this institute. It's a little bit early because we're not quite to the slide yet, um, but yeah, let him get a drink. Um, so usually I get a lot of questions on, there's a technique that's discussed in the cervical revolution course called the supine active sacrospinoflexion. And in that technique, we're actually facilitating a right lateral pterygoid. And I get a ton of email questions, a ton of questions about why we are facilitating a right lateral pterygoid. And in that technique, we're using that as a repositioning technique for the temporal bones. We're not trying to isolate mandibular movement um, from a typical position that we see um, patients uh, presenting in. So once we reposition patients using a technique like that, or there's other techniques in that course, then this left lateral pterygoid becomes the lateral pterygoid of emphasis to move the mandible to the right um, and so I just wanted to remind people again why um, there's differences there. And not only that, she opens the door for me to remind me that as we go through this, for those people in the room that do not or have not taken a PRI course, we're going to talk about the common human pattern of where the weight likes to go on our body when we stand. But right now we're just talking about how the foot works with the mandible and how the mandible works with the feet. So that we can then get into discussions about people who don't know how to move out of patterns with their mandible because they are now adapting to a uh, problem 
they can't move their weight from side to side. And the first thing you'll notice is that the necks of the body, and you have six, you have seven of them. You have two in your femur, two in your arm, two in your mandible, and one that your head sits on. Those seven necks will start to tell you things with tests I put together for this institute over the 20 some years of my life to help understand the word necks. And we're gonna get into this Hurusca abduction and adduction discussion a few weeks from now. So people can understand why that was put together because it's an adduction and abduction issue that has to do with necks and compressive forces. So when you start looking at this discussion and you start relaying it to normal common patterns, not of compensation, not of Mr. Pope's articles on compensatory postural adaptation patterns, but on common ways that humans adapt to the inability to get these necks to work cohesively together for movement that's called lateral rotary. So when we look at this next set of slides and you see these muscles now pop up, by the way, you have this on page 18. When you go look at uh, top of page 18, Jen put the pages right- aren't the same as yours because I gave you two pages or two handouts per page. Okay. They have three. So, but when you look at this slide. When you look at this right foot eversion, yep. you should be looking at right foot eversion on that slide, Jen. Thank you. And that muscle for eversion, the number one muscle that is giving you right foot eversion would be that muscle called the peroneus. And then if you go to the other one where it says right foot inversion, the number one muscle, there's more, but just for discussion is the tibialis posterior. And what I'm hopeful by the time we get done with this webinar, you'll understand when I see these two muscles, immediately I'm thinking of a certain pterygoid, a certain tongue, because they're gonna be one-to-one -one. because you're human. You can't redirect that, <laughs> that's impossible. So when you look at what you see in your manual, which I hope they have, Jen, I don't, they're, they're on the same page in the manual, yeah, right? Yeah. All you gotta do is look on the top and see right inversion and you know what the muscle is. Now we're gonna add some pterygoids and some tongue muscle with it. So here is an example of Hannah moving her mandible to the right with her left lateral pterygoid, her right foot inversion, which would be her right tibialis posterior. So we should recognize that your left lateral pterygoid, which is a big muscle in this institute. It's a big muscle in, with, in every institute. It has to have a counterpart. It's called, it's, right, it's called the right tibialis posterior. And when you look at that, the same above muscle on the other side will move the trunk to the left and shift the center of gravity to the left and the mandible to the left when upright and in a state of kneeling or standing, which we would call left AFIR. Now for discussion today, when I stand or I kneel, I have necks that allow me to laterally rotate. I have all my necks. But when I sit, that doesn't happen. And that's also coming up in this, in this, in this webinar. But right now, well, let's just talk about erect standing. The right genial glossus muscle the right lateral pterygoid and the right perineals contribute to right foot eversion and left foot inversion. Uh, if there was one slide in this webinar that is probably the most important slide, it's that one. I'm going to read it again. The right genial glossus, the right lateral pterygoid, the right perineals contribute to right foot eversion and left foot inversion. That's called a left AIC, right BC pattern. Yeah, I see. What's that? Right AIC. I'm sorry. The opposite, it's left AFIR, so it's a right. I'm AIC. so sorry, sorry, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. I almost screwed that up, Jen, so I'm glad you're sitting there. Okay, or left AFIR, thank you, Jen. Then we have, a, we have her going the other direction. That was big, thank you, Jen. When the mandible goes to the left, you're using your right lateral pterygoid and your right foot eversion, which is your right perineals. 
Unlike standing or kneeling, when you, and unlike standing or kneeling, mandibular movement influence on lateralization when the moving the mandible to one side and sitting, the body will shift over to the contralateral hip. So when you sit, you, you've lost your necks of your hip. And when you move your mandible from side to side, your mandible is not gonna move your body weight over to the right side or to the, if I move my mandible to the right, my body should go over to the right. We just went over that. Standing. In standing or in kneeling. But in sitting, if I move my mandible to the right side, my body weight will shift over to the left. So why don't you all do it right now? You're sitting, most of you, and then we'll stand. Just sit there for a minute, take everything, put your hands by your side, and just put your feet on the floor if you can. And if you're sitting on a cushiony couch, like I see some of you in, and you may not feel this as much. But when you move your mandible to the right in the, uh, and you're sitting on your seats of your rear, you should feel if you move your mandible to the right, your body up your body will go to the right, but in order for you to not fall, you're gonna go to the left. And then if you move your mandible to the left, you're gonna feel your body weight gently go over to the right. And I know I'm going over this fast because I've got a lot of material I want to cover. But if you stand now, just stand up, put both feet flat on the floor. You don't have to worry about if you've got shoe wear on or not. Hands by your side. Move your mandible to the right. And you'll feel your entire weight go to the right. You're going to feel everything go to the right on that floor. And if you move your mandible to the left, you should feel everything go to the left and your entire weight's gonna go over to the left on that floor. And if it's not doing these things that I'm suggesting, you probably have a neck issue, a cervical spine issue. You have a mandibular issue. You have a hyoid issue. So it's very easy for me to rule out who is who very quickly by that simple process you did right there. So unlike standing or kneeling, this is, this is something you should be, be aware of. This occurs because the necks of the femur and the ankles cannot accept transfer of weight of the body to the ipsilateral side. The sphenoid through unilateral lateral pterygoid contraction is moving to the opposite side of the sacral base that the mandible is moving away from. And that's an orthopedic, that's a, excuse me, that's a, uh, uh, an osteopathic. Yeah, but I want, that's an osteopathic way to write that what you just experienced. Thank you, Jen. And Jen said, you know, I'm not sure people are going to get that. So here's what she wrote. Jen, go ahead and read that while I take a drink. For example, when sitting, if your mandible is moving to the right through left lateral pterygoid contraction, you will more than likely transfer your body weight to the left of the sacral base, so to your left sit bone, as the sphenoid moves to the left as well. So mandible moves right, your sphenoid, and your body weight moves to your left. And what you see the sense above it is just where an osteopath would say it. Let's talk a few minutes about integration and some recommendations. There are one, two, three, four, five handouts that are in this webinar. And we are not gonna go over all those handouts. But the first one is was a reflection on instructions that you can look at yourself, you can have others carry out, and it's been around this institute for many, many years, and that is activating the left lateral pterygoid with protrusion. It's been around this institute for years. Um, I hope after this webinar today, you'll respect it a little bit more than you have. Uh, I hope you understand how it can be used both in sitting, standing, and kneeling. Then there's another set of, there's another uh, uh, handout that says upright alternating shift and lateral mandibular translation, uh, along with the standing lateral shift, unilateral occlusal uh, activity. One is with the mouth gently open, one's with the mouth gently closed. This upright ski shift squat technique, that's uh, been around for years. I don't even know what course it's in right now. I do know, but I can't. What's that? 
forward locomotor movement. It's a wonderful thing to look at because it's got mandible and, and ankle written all over it. And our goal is to remind you that the, some of the best mandibular mindful people I know are downhill skiers. I've worked with Olympians. The only reason why they brought me out there is to make sure the mandible allowed them to win a, win a, you know, uh, a medal. It's not the ankle. It's the mandible. It's the neck. When you, you look at the uh, mandibular movement recommendations that you have, there's some recommendations in the back of your handout that'll tell you what I would do. I do do every day in my life, a few of those, I'm mindful of that mandible. And what do you do? There's, I think, what, six of six instructions there, Jan? Something like that. Let's pull it out. I don't even remember. The active left leg. Oh, no, there's uh, mandible six. movement. Rec those six recommendations, anybody out there who's, whether you're a healthcare professional or not, should be able to pick that up and learn six ways to get out of it. Six ways to keep your mandible working with your feet every day. In fact, some of these, if you start now, should clear up some things that we haven't had time to get into. It would clear up a lot of things that you see in other courses being presented. So how to move your mandible when you sit, stand, how to get out of a chair, how to get out of a chair, how to get out of a chair. So those you have in the back of your handout, or the back of your manual. I wanna talk, I got about, what, 10, 15 minutes, Jen? Somewhere around there. I want to talk a little bit about research, okay? Just a little bit. I think it's the, the material that you have is worth the few minutes we're going to give it. The improvement of peripheral muscular balance while wearing a customized mandibular mouth guard reinforces the direct impact on overall body stability provided by lateral pterygoid freedom. And again, if you are like I am, I would underline the words lateral pterygoid freedom. I hope when you get down with this particular webinar, you'll all appreciate the significance of why you, you have excursion offered to your mouth. Um, you know, every time I see someone start telling me that, you know, a joint won't move, I always ask them, ask myself, I wonder if they would understand. I wonder if they would understand that it's not the joint. I wonder if they'd understand that the vestibular system is not going to allow you to move that joint. I wonder if they would understand that that vestibular system is not going to allow you to, to move that joint because the joints that really are regulating that joints begin with that mandible. I wonder if they'll get that. There isn't a discipline out there that's going to talk about this. So trust me, it's not in dental school. And, you know, when we start treating a, a temporal mandibular joint, as a joint, we're done. That is not a normal joint. Your mouth is hanging. Your mandible is hanging from your head. It is not needed to be pushed up into that joint. It was meant to be directed down and out and to the side. So your tongue can stay up. And if the tongue can't go up, don't blame the tongue. The tongue is not the problem. The tongue is working with the mandible that has no freedom. And then you just exhausted pterygoid work. You locked it up. And now the best pterygoids working with that foot down there is called the glossopharyngeus. And everybody, time I see somebody pulling on tongues on an individual that doesn't know how to ski, doesn't know how to move from side to side with their ankles, I get a little sick. I get a little paranoid. So thus we have these webinars. And if you've never taken a PRI course, find a PRI therapist to help understand what I just said. So the mechanics of movement in lateral direction, this truce of movement is so important for balanced activity. Three references for you. Significant more balanced activity of the cervical and dorsal muscles was observed under dynamic upright activities when over lateralized deviations of the mandible are reduced. It's not because of teeth. The teeth are there to help get into a position for you to remain patterned into over lateralized states. That didn't start with the feet. And it did not start with your vestibular system saying your heart's on one side and your liver's on the other side. It started where your dominance is, your cortical dominance. 
Your mandible is a reflection of pattern cortical dominance. So you can reduce it through customization of a mandibular mouth guard, but it's not going to take care of the issue if you don't follow through with something I put on the handouts in the back of your man manual. Transmission of torsion through muscle chains that influences the orientation of the mandible from the midline brings about alterations of the cervical muscles, producing changes in all the planes of the spinal column space at this level provoking descending compensations at both the dorsal and lumbar level. Basically, it's saying all the muscle chains that we have in your body really are, begin from the top with the mandible. The mandible is your number one cortical midline bone of the body. It lines up the cortexes. It takes the greater wings and gives them operational balance. It allows you to, to fight in flight and come home again. Any alteration at the lower limb could bring about ascending compensations and alterations of the mandible function in rest position and could influence both the dental and the pole arches. Our arches of our body are not regulated by the maxilla, are not regulated by the feet. Our arches of our body are regulated by your jaw. The relationship is, this relationship is associated with various studies that show that pronation of the foot causes an internal rotation of the tibia, which is accompanied by an internal rotation of the femur and an anteriorization of the pelvis and the consequent structure changes in the spine. This is termed by some authors as the global pronation of the complete global limb, Buckart. So when you start looking at pronation and you start looking at internal rotation, this global system that we have, by the way, this is a, uh, uh, this kind of material doesn't exist. Uh, let, me, let me back up. Anytime you see the word foot pronation, internal rotation of a tibia, and it's, you know, we have it in our institute as well as other fields of study. When you look at internal rotation pronation, hopefully you'll remember that the most important element of designed internal rotation comes from your two temporal bones. And those two temporal bones are not regulated by necessarily muscle. They're regulated by guidance of pressure produced by your mandible. They're guided by airway patencies behind the nose, through the nose, through the mandible. A predominance of anteriority of the center of the gravity when looking at the contact surfaces at the bottom of the feet during plantar grade phase of locomotion and the corresponding correlation of a predominance in the limited mandibular protrusion, which would be normally a class two, reflects lateral pterygoid influence on mandibular rest and rhythm characteristics. Wonderful article, Influence of Dental Malocclusion on Body Posture and Foot Posture in Children. It's that kind of article that we ought to be screaming to the top of the mountain about. That's the kind of material that is really physiologic, really physical, mindful. Another study reminds us how, how the mandible dynamics influence dynamic planner support. We're in a field of plantar support, all of us. Anybody in this room that's doing any movement is in a field called plantar support. The plantar support is totally based upon the mandibular guidance that you offer it. Significant differences were observed in the change position or change produced in right plantar support in relationship to mandibular dynamics in the subjects with normal occlusion. 15 out of 1,000 people would, be, would have something that would be a little different than that. That means there's a lot, of the, the p-value is so high. There is a relationship between that growing and growing human, between the mandible and your foot. In the case of left plantar support, the change was significantly higher in individuals with malocclusion than without. Uh, get it, cranial 2022. 
influence of occlusion and mandibular position on foot support and head posture in adult patients. The mandible is supported primarily by passive mechanical activity, passive mechanisms arising from viscoelasticity of the soft tissues in the perioral, perioral area. Short latency stretch reflexes in the jaw closing movement of the jaw muscles occurs during forward locomotor movement. We don't, we don't chew when we run or walk, but we definitely go through stretch reflexes. The functions of the stretch reflex in the jaw muscles is to maintain posture. Our mouth was meant to move around when we walk to maintain posture. Those stretch reflexes recalibrate your vestibular cerebellar activity. And if a mandible is not free, which is why I do not encourage you to walk and run with any appliance in your mouth, you're going to, you're going to be limited now in your ability to alternate. The maximal downward movement of the mandible is usually less than one millimeter during walking or running, but it's got to be free. The function of the stretch reflex in the jaw muscles is to maintain and restore the postural position of the mandible when it's perturbed during rapid head movement. When you move your head, when I move my head, you can't move your head independent of your neck if your mandible is locked into your maxillas. Miles, Journal of Physiology, 2004. Overactivation of one or both lateral pterygoids secondary to mandibular rest position, male dental occlusion or plantar rest position, male podal occlusion reduces short latency stretches, stretch reflexes of the mandible and rhythmic forward lateral movement of the cervical spine. The dorsal column medial lemniscus pathways is a sensory pathway of the central nervous system that conveys sensations of fine touch, vibration, two-point discrimination, and proprioception. It transmits information from the body to the primary somatosensory cortex and the post-central gyrus of your parietal lobe of the brain. Why did I talk about that? Because that that is the essence of why the mandible and other parts of our body need to discriminate. We get that information. And I, Jen, I hope I, I asked you earlier if we can see it. And there it is. This is your dorsal root. This is the, this is the medial lemniscus. That information comes up and it's processed way up here, way up here through the thalamus, the post central gyrus. That information goes Re that information of information, the information of information you're re receiving, the affrontation is received so well when your mandible is freed up. And the article and the researchers will tell you that you can lock somebody up so quickly by just having them bite down. So the importance of this is remember that we have pathways. Our bodies, our bodies, all of our bodies are built off of the sensory pathways of the central nervous system that conveys these sensations of fine, infinite touch and vibration. If you could just write there by the word vibration and discrimination, our two-point discrimination, our vibration. If we keep our mandibles free, that vibration sense goes way up. But the minute we start locking up our mandibles, our discrimination goes way down. That's why some people have no straight leg raise and some people can touch their nose. Neither one is good. But to discriminate, you've got to keep that pathway. And then one part of your body that will have the biggest impact on how the other necks of the body work is that mandible which is why I use orthotics, why the two orthotics I built for the, for the mouth on the typical human I work with keep canine to molar activity to keep that freedom of sensory input going up those pathways as we just described. Just a quick comment on it. These receptors in the soles of the feet, the receptors in the soles of the feet and the upper anterior section of the tongue are normalized by achieving dental occlusion in standing. By integrating these neurological sensors, podal sensors, 
with postural balance associated with uninhibited non-glossal mandibular lateral protruders. What did he just say? Uninhibited non-glossal mandibular lateral protruders. Our tongues become overutilized, overactive when they're inhibited and their glossal mandibular lateral protrusion is their primary source for lateral movement. The tongue wasn't made to be a lateral pterygoid. Your patencies are going to go down. Your heads are going to go forward. It's not the tongue's fault. And it's not the tongue's problem. <clears throat> I think I got a few more and I'm done, right, Jen? Wash them. Optimizing functional occlusion requires static plantar pressures in standing. And I didn't stutter. We, didn't, we weren't made to have dentists work on our teeth in a lean back seated state. That's just not the way we're made. Uh, to look at someone's upright posture without understanding how to optimize it by making sure this, that your sense of how you stand on your feet foremost or first uh, is, is really tough for me to understand. Um, so during maximum mouth opening or during maximum relaxation of the mandible elevators during mandibular protrusion is kind of big. If you can't protrude your mouth and deviate to one side, uh, your ability to open your mouth or ability to operate that mouth is uh, is false. You're getting a neck, at, you're getting neck function, you're getting hyoid function, you're getting tongue function. Uh, so optimizing functional occlusion requires static plantar pressure during maximum mouth opening or during maximum relaxation of the mandible elevators. We don't need temporalis muscles regulating our feet. You need pterygoids regulating the feet. And if you got temporalis muscles and master muscles regulating your feet, there are two other sets of muscles that are gonna help regulate those feet. Um, they're called latissimus muscles, and they're called adductors, usually on the right side more than the left of your hip. And their ability to adduct and do things called Peruska adduction abduction testing is gonna be very challenged. So mandibular opening, and inframandibular suprahyoid muscle activity, as we talk about in this course called uh, you know, voice box, is extremely important. I would love to see a voice box course filled with 100 people so that you understand the uniqueness of a mandible. Uh, this came from uh, uh, something I found on the internet. So I'm, I'm, I'm appreci I appreciate all the research I read about this total and and uh, this 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 mandibular activity but unfortunately uh, we don't have time today to go over all that I just picked a few things um, I want to tell you that the topic mandible when we decided to do uh, these webinars when the topic mandible came off came up I don't Jen uh, I, I could have filled probably every weekend uh, you know a webinar on the mandible I've been working with the mandible all my life. Uh, I developed a pool because of a mandible, uh, stations in a pool because of a mandible. And you know, when it comes to understanding the entire system that we live with, uh, things go in and out of our system uh, with the mandible. Just remember I said that. They go in and out of your system. Your gut is your mandible. Your eyesight is your mandible. That will be the next webinar. Your hearing is your mandible. Your, it's, it's, it's imperative you understand that any neck you own on your body, including the necks of your ribs, are owned by that mandible. So we're, we're feet people. We like to look at things from the floor up. I hope that after this webinar today, you understand there is no way you can be just a foot person after this webinar. You are just as much of a descending individual as you are an ascending individual largely because of the, the discussion we ha I had today with you regarding the, those two muscles of your foot as it relates to those muscles in your mouth called pterygoids and tongue.
Genio Glosses. I want to thank you for your time. I know we have time. Jen always reminds me I want time for questions. So I planned about an hour and a half. We got about 15, 20 minutes, and I'll be glad to answer any questions you might have. Awesome. Sounds good. Um, just a reminder um, before I turn off the slide share, um, our next webinar is scheduled for Friday, May 19th at 1 central time again. So if you want to put that on your calendar, um, that will be our next webinar. Um, and then before we uh, answer uh, the questions that are coming in here on the chat, Ron, um, there, Ron mentioned there's five handouts um, that go along with this PowerPoint handout. Um, Ron, just one thing before I pull up a couple of these questions, can you just go over again, I think just to clear up for people, um, why the mandible is off, why these practitioners are often seeing a mandible moved over sure. to the left um, yeah. in the kind of normal human asymmetrical pattern and why we want the mandible to move to the right when we're in right stance and not be positioned to the left. Right, it's a good, it's a good question. So if the world was perfect, we wouldn't need to have webinars like this. We would be moving from side to side, Jen, and it'd be pretty easy to look at patterns and look at non-pattern movement. And by the way, non-pattern movement of the body is called the mandible. It's not meant to be patterned. Uh, so let's keep that in mind. However, when the mandible becomes patterned with patterns of the body, it tells you that you're not alternating very well. Something's going on. Your ability to shift over to one side, let's go to the right, is cortically designed a little easier for you than it is to go what, Jen? To the left. And when I go to the right, and I have, I feel like I'm pretty coordinated with my movement at my age, and I'm a neutral guy, and I can go to the right, my mandible will probably enjoy going to the right by moving my mandible to the right and my head to the left, as we all did a few minutes ago. So you'll shift to the side the mandible goes toward. But if I stay on my right, I like my right hand. I like to write with my right hand. I like to feed myself with my right hand. I like to get on highways and not get killed by driving on the right side of the road. I open up little uh, doorways that have a little thing called a knob on them. Our ergonomics of the world we're in was designed for cortical dominance. And I live in that world and I become subject to the adaptations associated with that world. And I don't really get the opportunity anymore to move my body weight over to the left and let go of those inverters on my right. And now my mandible is saying, wait a minute, I got to get to the left, Jen. And my mandible is saying, well, get over there, but don't plan on taking my bo your body with you. You're, you're planted over here. And now your mandible has got to work really hard getting over which, which way? To the left. The right genial glossus, the right lateral pterygoid, they're going to work really hard with that greater wing and that sphenoid activity to allow you to generate movement to the left with your upper half more around the head and neck, the upper brachial wall, than you like without the entire body going where, Jen? Over to the left. And so we call that in this institute, someone who likes to stay on their right leg, likes to over-rotate their body to the left above the belt, above somewhere in that abdomen, over to the left, and now their ability to alternate is limited. Their mandible doesn't even go to the right anymore. Instead of worrying about the, the, the fact that they can't get their body to the left, they can't get their mandible to the right. So how are they ever going to do this PRI work if they can't get their mandible, which way, Jen? To, to the, the right. right. Which is why the left lateral pterygoid is the first, the first exercise, non-manual technique I ever wrote out because I was working with a bunch of dentists that had sent me a slew of shoulder and TMJ patients. And I, I could do miracles with the thing called the left genioglossus, the left lateral pterygoid, and the corresponding muscle associated with it so that they could evert, evert and invert correctly. They could evert the right foot and invert the left foot with the muscles in this webinar associated with that left lateral pterygoid. Miracles would happen, Jen. Miracles. And then when I showed him what to do with an appliance to reduce these abduction and adduction lift issues, 
people would say, wait a minute, well, how did you do that with the inner thigh and the abdominals and the floor? Because we still got to treat somehow this floor issue up. So the answer, to, or I'm hopeful I'm giving you some feedback on the importance of looking at the system by looking at necks. And the neck that we're talking about today is called the condylar neck. And therefore, a mandible that's going to the left likes to have a condylar neck protruding on the right as that mandible goes forward and to the left. And then you just have to do the math. When that mandible stays there, chews there, talks there, and feeds my, my brain information about how I sound and how I breathe there, it's really hard to get individuals to go from side to side at that point, regardless of what you do. One of the things that we've done in this institute, and I think we've done a good job, Jen, is every single non-manual technique says this. Breathe in through your nose. Just remember I said that. Every single one. Loud, breathe in through your what? Nose. And when you breathe in through your nose, you just freed up the mandible. You want to free up the mandible? Breathe in through your nose. <laughs> because if you breathe in through your mouth, you just locked up the entire system. Sounds good. Okay, let's take um, some of these questions that are coming in. Uh, the first question, um, Lydia said, does wearing braces for teeth as a growing child affect the function of the mandible, temporal, and sphenoid in a negative way? Yes, but that negative way is there only for a while. <laughs> we were meant to have hardware on teeth. Your tongue's going to explore that hardware. You're going to be put in a position where you're in, in unrest. Now, I didn't mean that in a negative way. You have to, you were, you were given braces to help teeth get in better positions. Here's the problem we're in. The world we have, we don't, I, I went to a dental office yesterday and the world's so strange. I walk in there because the dental people in that office know that we don't put braces on anybody unless their necks are neutral. I said, plural. We don't work in that world. So when we put braces on people that have neutral necks, is it detrimental? Yeah, it could keep the neck. It's not the best thing in the world, but you know what? It's a small price today for pay for a certain amount of time, provided that you keep the body's necks all neutral while those braces are on. Cervical rotation, arm rotation, leg rotation, and mandibular rotation. And that's why I really, really love the uh, people I work with because we know we try not to limp, we try to move on as fast as we can. Only the minimum amount of work needed, we try to do that. And there are some patients, we don't even start braces until we sh shut the entire system what? Down. We, we, you know, when you can, you know, wear this appliance and breathe at night and like your life again, we'll start up some braces. You know, we don't look at life that way. So it's a great question and I wish I could answer it differently, but I can't. All right, um, Braden said, Ron mentioned that you should not walk or run with dental appliances in. Why wouldn't you want to do that? Uh, anytime you put anything in your mouth when you walk or run and you start the old heart rate up and you need to breathe, uh, you're, you're slowing air, airflow. And that, whether, now look, uh, you know, there's always exceptions. But any appliance that I work with a dentist on, and if I'm working with a runner, they don't wear it when they run. Um, because I can tell you right now, when you start moving uh, and you start swinging your arms, you're not going to be closing your mouth. So the first thing that you want to remember is that when you put a guard in to play football, that's to protect your teeth. Uh, it's not to play football. <laughs> it's to protect your teeth. That's different than putting a guard in to help somebody understand, you know, what it feels like to have a canine to a molar sense. That's a different thing. So guards to box, to play basketball, no problem. I'm talking about dental appliances, occlusal appliances for, for reorganizing teeth position to help stabilize joints, et cetera, et cetera. There's a, 
it just, uh, we can't just throw everything in the frying pan here, Jan. Mm -hmm. Okay. So please don't do that. That's not what I was trying to get across. Um, okay. Uh, Rondell said, uh, thank you for the mentorship. How does the suboptimal function of the mandible affect airflow within the cranium? When you say mandible, submandible operation, by the way, I appreciate you so much for asking the question. Uh, suboptimal uh, mandibular movement is simply, if you make it real simple, is mandibular movement with over elevation. So uh, that would be masseters, temporalis muscles, medial pterygoids, over elevation. Let me tell you a form of over elevation. Over elevation is a forward head posture. So Anytime the head goes forward, the neck is starting to reduce its 30 degrees of cervical lordosis, you are over, overworking elevators of that mandible. And all hats, everything I talked about today is off. It's not this discussion today. None of it would have any significance at all because the head is not allowing the palate, the pharyngeus expansion that you need uh, to breathe. That's suboptimal. Optimal, optimization of a mandible is freedom to move all three sets of necks because the cervical spine is neutral. And when the cervical spine becomes neutral, mandibular optimization is usually acquired. What throws you out of that optimal site of optimization is occlusion, vision and sense, excuse me, and, and use of tongue. And that's when you have to get, look at each one of those cases and say, which of those three is now allowing me to stay in an optimal position with my head? We say head, when I say head, I'm not talking about the mandible. The mandible is not part of your head. I know many of you in the chat room, I know I've seen many of you, and I know I've taught many of you. When I say the word mandible, there's only one thing on your body that knows you have a mandible, and that is your neck. The mandible is your neck. It controls all of your necks. The neck is the mandible. Before you start working on a neck, after you take a cervical course and you get neutral necks, if you want to optimize the neck, which would have been even a better question, how can I optimize neck function once I achieve cervical neutrality? Optimize mandibular control. And the necks of the humerus and the necks of the femur, like Ron drew up on this board over here. You want centric in all three of those. If you only have centric in your uh, sphenoid occlusion mandible and you're not considering what's beneath it, that's not centric. Centric, centric, centric. And I can't wait to talk about centric with my name on it called the Rusk Abduction Adduction Lip Test. So we truthfully know why I put those tests together. Truthfully. Okay, uh, Donna said, can you explain the supinated high arch foot and what the mandible is doing in that scenario? That's a good question. Who asked that question? Uh, I think it's Donna. D-H-A-N-A. -A, that would be the kind of question I would like for a webinar like this. Ask it again. Can you explain the supinated high arch foot and what the mandible is doing in that scenario? I should, you just maybe you should say likely doing. Likely doing. Almost a, I, I will say likely because you're, you're right. But more than likely. Did you hear what I did there? More than likely your mandible is over retruded. And you're taking your tongue and you're pushing it forward in those teeth to regulate neck function because of a head that's too far forward. And the only way you can do that safely is you gotta get off your big toes. And the only way for you to do that is to over converge. And when you overconverge and get off your big toes, you will maximally evert because now you don't have the freedom to use any of your necks for lateral rotary function. So 
uh, molars, you know, you get these, you get class twos quickly in your mouth, malocclusion, narrow palates, you get these things called bone growth laying down everywhere. Tongues look too large. I am going to plead with everybody. I'm an old man. It's not the tongue. <laughs> that tongue is fine. The mouth is too small. Okay. It's a good question, whoever asked it. Thank you. Um, Joan said, this makes me think of a young patient with Down syndrome with flat feet and tongue thrust. Yep. I'm excited to try upright alternating shift and lateral mandibular translation, the, yep. one of the handouts. Perhaps this is the best way to improve tongue, or sorry, tone at both ends, at the tongue and at the uh, feet. Joan, again, thank you. I see you. Thank you. I want to hug you. Thank you. Uh, man, I appreciate people like you. Yeah, it's a good idea. Good yeah. thing to definitely consider. Yeah. Um, speaking on what kind of Joan just asked, Ron, can you touch on why the active left lateral pterygoid uh, in protrusion to hand out that we gave them yeah. is done in supine yeah. versus these other activities that we talked about are done in either standing yeah. or seated. Yeah. Simply because we're actually trying to remodel a position, a pattern of the body without the floor. I don't want to introduce the floor yet. It's more about sphenoid it's, position, it's just, right? It's a, it's sphenoid a, and temporal. exactly what it is. Yeah. It's just to allow you to regulate airflow without having to be confused by podal sense. Your mandible was built off of podal sense. Now we want podal sense. That's why we do 90-90s. That's why I refuse to, you know, I don't know why anybody would take their foot off of a wall for 90-90s and just put a heel down because you just really messed up the tongue. But anyway, that's another day, another dollar. So when I put, when those techniques come out where you're just laying on your back and there's nothing under your feet. Bolster, nothing under your feet. Nothing under your feet. That's an ideal way to recalibrate pharyngeuses, palates. It's an ideal way. Because you don't have to worry about, you don't have to think about where do I put my neck? See, these are all neck patients. You've got seven of them. Uh, well, are, are there any others? Yeah, there's a few more. Yeah. Um, so if someone was struggling with the upright lateral pterygoid work, would you put them back into this position so they did possibly, not have to possibly right uh, fight the podal influence? Possibly, yes. Okay. Possibly. Um, uh, he's, uh, McCoy or Mike, uh, he goes by, says, what do you think about working on consonants and syllabus articulation vocalization to help balance the two sides? I think it's a great idea. Yep. In fact, I often think about how much things I do in life that's wrong. Who, what's, who was that? Uh, it goes by Mike. Mike, my biggest problem when I lay in bed and I thinking about what we probably ought to be doing with the human body as a, as a humanity issue, social issue. And that would be communication with your, vo your voice. You know, I mean, there's so many things we can do with that, that whole ability to pronunciate words and syllables and consonants and positions with your oral cavity that'll regulate your extraskeletal cavities more so than the other way around. I still think it's one of the biggest hidden meanings. Even our own oral myologist, speech therapists, have, can only see light coming out of a crack one way. It's called their school of thought, where they went to school. They didn't become, you know, postural experts before they started their career in speech therapy or oral management. So, lovely question, lovely question. Uh, speech to me is as more is as important as any fascial component you're working on probably more important it's called a human it's a only purpose you have uh, besides the only purpose you have besides swallowing chewing is talking let's just all remember that it's the only purpose you have you're a person that's supposed to uh, be better at communicating than a cow that ruminates all day 
Just remember that. Really big deal. Okay, there's just a couple more. Um, Mark said, does a mandibular advancement surgery make sense if the mandible is too short by a fourth of an inch diagnosed by orthodontist and TMD, or that can this be healed by other means such as PRI techniques or intervention? Well, that's a tough question to answer. Now, I just was again two weeks ago <clears throat> in an office where I fully concurred that they got to do a, you know, a ramus, they got cut and pull and, you know, pull a, a mandible forward a little bit and up. And uh, the answer is every patient's different. Every patient's different. And I, I believe in surgery when it's necessary. I truthfully believe in surgery when it's necessary. Uh, it's not a question I can answer because I don't know what the individual is like that you're looking with. I don't know what they look like. I don't know how they, I don't know how they regulate themselves. Remember, we started this conversation today with what's regulating all this. I don't know if they can even move their head independent of their mandible. I don't know if the six things on the handout you have that I gave you, they can do any of them. I don't know. Because again, growth is a reflection of genetics and environment. So if that person never really was put in a situation for expression and gesturing of the mouth, I don't know. Is it too late? I don't know. So it's a good question, but you wouldn't want me to answer that question. Um, Mark said, if braces were put on a neck that was not neutral, what would be the treatment after the fact? Will braces need to be put back on? You know, the treatment is they're going to be put back on. <laughs> and I'm not trying to be funny. <laughs> There's, or they're going to develop an anterior open bite, which you'll always see. Braces come off. And these little thumb suckers, if they weren't, they're probably struggling to go with airway because the tongue's pushing through the front of the mouth and they'll be put back into braces. I've seen so many of this, so much of this. Uh, it'll catch up sooner or later. And any or good orthodontist who does this will recognize it. And they just, some of these orthodontists don't know where to go. They just don't know how to, what's the show here? Um, you know, I've seen, I've seen people with braces in their mouth up to five times. And I'm not making that up. And so, you know, that's called stress. It's called vault, V-A-U-L-T, vault keystone stress. Not because a palate's got a brain, but because the brain has a palate. And that brain will pull that palate and it will regulate that activity, regardless of what you do with, you know, the pinstripes in the vehicle called teeth. So all I'm saying is, you know, Ideally, we were given this body with this neck that houses a cranium that's regulated by two sides called polar instinct. And that polar instinct is called mandibular temporal flow. So again, just to recapitalize on why we're here today, I'll take one yeah, more question. One more question. Uh, so Sarah says she's a spinal cord injury nurse here. Oh, wow. Do you have any experience working with the mandible in people with quadriplegia or paraplegia, I'm curious how they're yeah. impacted by PRI's work. Limited experience early on in my career, Sarah. I'm not by an expert, expert by many means, any means, but I will say this. I look at every individual as if they had nothing wrong with them. And that would include the paraplegic. And I start there. Because if we start treating, like, treating them like a person with scoliosis, a person with paraplegia, a person with diabetes, we're going the wrong direction. They still have to breathe. They still have to operate the mandible. It's the same. If they did, let me put it this way, Sarah. If they didn't have operational use of their mandible, they probably would not be alive. In other words, there's something, I mean, we're talking about most people have the ability to operate a mandible. Most people. So are there exceptions? Of course there are. I've seen people have tried to take their lives and they, you know, blew off a mandible and they come to their senses and they wish they would have never have done it. But they, they, are, they are no different. They are different, but they're no different than you and I are. They still got to eat. They still got to express. They still got to breathe. And they still have necks. So it's the latter that I started an institute over. 
And so I would look at each one of those individuals and I would do everything I can to keep that neck and all the accompanying necks in a position of rest. Yep. I really enjoyed this. Thank you for the questions, everybody. I appreciate it. Uh, again, a lot of the stuff that we went over has been introduced in some form or another. It's never been put together like these webinars are put together, but I really want this to stick around a while. I wanna just get, share this webinar information with other people. This was not a webinar for PTs or OTs or speech therapists. It's a webinar for the general public. So get the general public to understand what you do if you're a PRI person, what do you do? Help them understand what you do. They need you. So I, I appreciate your time. I really, truly do. Yeah, thank you, everyone. And it will be available to share in about a week or so. It'll be on our webinars page of our website. Um, so please take a look there. Uh, the handouts are there as well. And all of our webinars will be posted there um, when they're completed. So thank you again for joining us, everyone. Have a great weekend um, and uh, enjoy. Thanks.